Our next speaker is Matthew Present, a second year student at Pritzker um, and a Buxbaum Institute student scholar. Um, uh, Matt participated in Pritzker's annual remedy medical service trip to Peru. Um, currently, he's working with Dr. Nadal Leiterapong uh, on individualization of glycemic control goals in patients with type 2 diabetes. But today, Matt will speak to us on the Affordable Care Act um, and, um, uh, and diabetes care. Matt. Okay. Uh, my name is Matt Present. I am indeed a second year medical student. If everything goes well uh, next Monday when I take the boards, I will eventually be a third year medical student. Um, and if uh, Dr. Roberts can figure out how to make that a pass fail exam in the meantime, that would be uh, really appreciated. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk today uh, about some research I did with uh, Dr. Nedalai Tirapong uh, and, and some folks on her team as well um, that we conducted last summer, uh, and it's a national physician survey. So um, this map here uh, is, is obviously an important one in health policy today. The blue states on there are states that elected to expand Medicaid uh, under the provisions of the ACA. Uh, and the eligibility now is uh, to include individuals who earn uh, below 138% of the federal poverty level. Uh, the yellow states or orange states um, elected not to do so. So in total, uh, there are 31 states, as well as the District of Columbia, that have indeed expanded uh, their eligibility criteria. And there are 19 states so far that have not done this. Um, so in addition to being um, uh, providing for a fractured care uh, system, uh, it also provides for pretty fertile ground for natural experimentation. And for us to sort of begin to solve one of the um, uh, essential questions of, of modern healthcare, which is how much does insurance matter? Uh, and in what areas does it matter? And, and does it matter to the, to the bottom line of, of keeping people uh, healthier? So um, Dr. Leitzirpong and her team and I um, were interested in, in this in, in relation to type 2 diabetes, uh, in part because it is the most expensive uh, disease in the United States, uh, in part because uh, it is the seventh leading cause of death, um, and then uh, in, 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 in part because it is sort of a, a, a proxy for a lot of chronic illness care in the United States. So we wanted to know um, the impact of the ACA's Medicaid expansion specifically uh, on whether or not physicians would report if they practiced in the states where Medicaid had been expanded, um, that they saw an increase in their particular patient panel of new patients with type 2 diabetes. So uh, a little bit of context. Um, there's some startling numbers in relation to, to diabetes nationwide. Um, and the first is that almost a third of the people who have diabetes um, have not been diagnosed. Uh, the pathophysiology of diabetes uh, makes, uh, that, that statistic makes a little bit of sense given that um, so many of the complications uh, occur in the later stages of the disease. And if you don't have regular care, um, then, then you can certainly very easily slip through the cracks. Um, but perhaps even more startling is that almost a quarter of the folks who do have diagnosed diabetes don't have health insurance, um, which if you pause and, and think about that reality, um, it's, it, it, it's a scary one for those folks. Um, and so the reason why we thought this might be a really interesting question to ask is because um, diabetes and access to care uh, and, uh, and the socioeconomic determinants of health, um, they dovetail somewhat. So uh, in general, poor populations tend to have less insurance, and poor populations tend to have higher rates of diabetes. Um, and indeed, uh, almost half of the folks who have diagnosed diabetes in the United States um, would qualify for insurance under the Medicaid expansion if they lived in states where, um, where it was expanded. So. Um, the ACA and the Medicaid expansion um, was, was really um, positioned well to take a bite out of some of these uh, uh, startling statistics. So our survey went out in three waves, uh, and it was mailed out. Uh, it was uh, anonymous, self-administered. Um, and in fact, um, as, as Dr. Siegler mentioned, this part about the ACA was couched within a, a larger set of questions relating to glycemic goals and, and tailoring them. Um, and, and diabetes care more generally. Um, and so it went on to about 1,200 physicians. 
And we had three questions in specific. Uh, and we chose not to frame them directly in relation to the ACA or to use any of the buzzwords because we felt that that would probably corrupt our data. Um, certainly people, uh, especially if we're asking about recall, recall of their uh, practice personally, um, may sort of supply answers that they, that they feel would support their given political position, um, especially in such a charged environment as ours. So we asked in the last two years, have you had an increase in the number of Medicaid or newly insured patients with diabetes in your practice? And we wanted to know uh, how many of these Medicaid or newly insured patients did you diagnose with diabetes yourself? And then we also wanted to know how many of these folks were newly insured but came from that crowd um, that had been diagnosed with diabetes but hadn't had access to insurance. So um, we also wanted to make sure that we were only focusing on asking physicians who had uh, longitudinal relationships with their patients because we didn't just want to understand whether or not their rate of diagnosis was increasing but hopefully be able to tie that to, to access to treatment. Um, and so um, while there have been uh, brilliant presentations from intensivists today and hospitalists and ER docs, uh, palliative care physicians, um, they were not eligible uh, in our study. So we broke it out. Uh, evenly divided between expansion and non-expansion states. And um, about three-fifths were uh, self-identified as primary care doctors based on their responses to the AMA master file, and 40% were endocrinologists. Um, and luckily, we found um, that uh, our respondents uh, mirrored our recipients, um, both in terms of their specialty, uh, and more importantly for our, this particular set of questions, um, they mirrored it geographically. So it was almost exactly 50-50 physicians who practiced in expansion states and physicians who practiced in non-expansion states. Um, and then finally, uh, we were happy to see um, that the demographics of our respondents corresponded well to the national demographics of physicians. So our response rate here, uh, and this slide uh, is particularly included for Dr. Sifu, who taught me all about response bias and uh, um, uh, why this is maybe not the best response rate. But um, in terms of peer surveys of national physician surveys, 41% uh, response rate does beat out a lot of peer surveys. Uh, and that's because uh, uh, for the physicians in the audience, uh, we tend not to answer uh, surveys. Uh, in fact, uh, one survey uh, uh, of surveys um, said that almost half of physicians don't even open them. So we thought 41 was, was actually pretty good. Um, and we did get uh, a critical number to be powered to kind of some, come to some conclusions about this particular question. So, and we did find some compelling results. Uh, physicians who practiced in ACA expansion states were twice as likely to report an increase in Medicaid or newly insured patients with diabetes. Um, and of course, that stands to reason, right? If you, if you expand Medicaid, you, know, you would be more likely to maybe see an increase uh, in, in, in patients with diabetes. Um, but we felt that it was an important question to ask, both to quantify that effect uh, and, and also to establish it. Um, and uh, we... Uh, so the next question that we, we, we need to ask ourselves, of course, is, is, is whether, particularly with a chronic illness, where so much rests on uh, adherence uh, and, and doctor-patient relationship, um, whether this increase in insurance will actually bear fruit in terms of the outcomes that we matter about most, morbidity and mortality. So in this context, um, uh, I, I have a few sort of uh, thoughts to share about the literature. So the first question is, is, does health insurance matter in terms of if folks are insured, do they end up going to the doctor more? Or are they under treatment more? Um, and with diabetes patients, the answers are resounding yes. Uh, the literature, uh, one study puts it at uh, diabetes patients um, with insurance are five times as likely to have a consistent source of care. And not only that, but folks who received insurance generally uh, under the ACA, both uh, in, the, in the new markets uh, as, as well as the Medicaid expansion, we're twice as likely to have an annual checkup. So we are getting people um, under care uh, much more significantly uh, when they do have access to insurance. So the next question, if that's established, is, OK, so if they're under our care, does that lead to better outcomes? And particularly, does that lead to better outcomes with this chronic illness, um, type 2 diabetes? And the answer here is a little bit trickier. And, and again, that relates to the micro and macro, macrovascular sequelae of the disease don't often um, manifest themselves until much later um, in, in the disease course. So 
the sort of best natural experiment that we have to date is the 2008 Oregon Health Insurance Experiment. Um, in, in, in that particular state, uh, there were two populations, um, uh, one that received Medicaid and, and, and one that did not. And this was um, sort of sterling because it's, it's totally randomized. They, they simply had, I think, 90,000 new um, slots of eligibility for Medicaid and about twice as many people applied. So they've followed them since. Um, and perhaps a little bit surprisingly, after two years, the folks who got Medicaid coverage who had type 2 diabetes, um, didn't, they didn't see any significant improvements in uh, hemoglobin A1C levels, which is the benchmark barometer uh, in many ways for, for diabetes care success, um, or in other physical health outcomes. But if you keep looking, it starts to make a difference. Uh, another study uh, demonstrated that diabetes uh, to patients who received care earlier were less expensive to treat, um, and uh, the initiation of insulin therapy was delayed. Uh, and then one of uh, the very few longitudinal uh, studies uh, outside of the uh, Oregon uh, um, Health Insurance Study uh, found that, in fact, uh, all other things being equal, um, uh, insurance does significantly lower uh, hemoglobin A1C rates. So I do just want to mention um, one important uh, set of confounders, uh, and, and, and it's actually negative confounders. So the, the map on the top um, highlights uh, states that have the highest rates of diabetes. Um, and I believe that the ones in red uh, have uh, rates uh, over 10% in the general population, which is startling no matter how many times you hear it. Uh, and then the map on the bottom is, is one that should be familiar to you by now. It's the map of states that have expanded versus those that have not. Um, so as you can see, um, unfortunately, the states where, this where the Medicaid expansion would have the most profound impact are states where they have chosen not to expand coverage. Um, and so this is a negative confounder for us um, because you're sort of um, waiting upstream in, in, in terms of having the general population numbers to see more patients in your practice. Um, specifically, uh, nine of the 14 states uh, that have double-digit rates uh, in the United States uh, uh, are, are states that did not expand Medicaid, uh, and 12 of the, the 19 total exceed the national average. Um, so uh, in, in sum, uh, physicians in ACA expansion states were more than twice as likely to report an increase in the number of newly insured and Medicaid patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, and as we spoke about just a minute ago, given that the early detection and regular treatment are associated with improved outcomes in the long term, the increased access with the Medicaid expansion may indeed improve uh, these long-term outcomes in type 2 uh, diabetes patients. Uh, just a few words on limitations. Um, obviously, response bias. Uh, with a 41% response rate um, is somewhat uh, uh, problematic. We were glad to see, however, that the, um, that the respondents um, tended not to be segmented in any particular area with regard to geography, specialty, um, or, or, or demographic background. Uh, and then the second thing is, um, of course, recall bias. So uh, we, we, we sort of generally asked physicians because it was one part of a 55-question survey um, based on their, on their general recollection or general feel. Um, and so with that, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Bucksbaum Institute for uh, having me up here, um, as well as uh, all of the folks uh, uh, that I worked with on the team, Dr. Leitierpong um, and Aviva, uh, uh, Natalie, and, and Louisa. Uh, and with that, uh, if you have any questions, uh, so long as they're not too hard, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> Yeah, that was a really good presentation. Thank you. Um, I seem to recall that there's some early studies now that retinopathy is actually being diagnosed and treated earlier in people who have medical care, obviously, than those that don't. And, of course, the implication is if treatment, photocoagulation or whatever will decrease blindness, it will have a really big effect in the longer term. So I wonder what your response or whether I'm right in terms of that evaluation. Um, I, I will certainly have to look into it. And for now, I'll, you look like an honest guy, so I'll take your word for it. <laughs> no, actually, that, that, that's, that's terrific. Um, uh, I, I haven't read those studies, but uh, starting next month, we have our scholarship and discovery block when I'll be writing this up more broadly for... 
some indications of that sort. But, you know, it was the excellent study. So. That, that's terrific. That's really helpful. Thank you. That's a really nice study. Thanks for the plug, too. <laughs> um, it, you know, obviously, the, the big problem is the is the physician recall, right? Um, because, you know, as I think, God, do I know if I've seen more diabetics over the last two years, and is that reliable? Um, did you guys look into, or are you going to, um, sort of more, I don't know, reliable, valid ways of, you know, based on hemoglobin A1C measurements that have been billed to Medicare, Medicaid, or, or whatever, to see if that kind of correlates with what you guys found? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, the, the, the trouble with this, um, and, and it's actually kind of remarkable, is, is that it's really hard to find longitudinal data on people who don't have insurance um, and in terms of their hemoglobin A1C levels. Um, the study uh, that, that, I, that I cited here, um, I, it was one of two that I could find, and it's, uh, it's, it's reliable, but it's, again, a relatively small cohort. Um, you taught me all about confounders, and it's really difficult to isolate the, the confounders that you have in insured versus uninsured populations. That being said, there is a lot of Medicare, or, or sorry, excuse me, Medicaid data um, that would be uh, um, coming out, we're still, I think, a little early in terms of seeing much of that. Even though the expansion was 2013, the, the, I think the data tends to lag behind by two to three years. Um, but uh, you know, you're, you're absolutely right that that would be the next step is is, is to correlate it to, to the more objective measurements that we can we can find. All right, I got 220 left. Thank you.